Well, good evening and welcome to our uh, worship this evening at uh, Dingwall and Strathpeffer uh, Free Church. The psalmist says to us in uh, Psalm 106, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or, de- or fully declare his uh, praise and there is, a, there is a real sense in which we gather together this evening to do the impossible. We, uh, uh, we gather together in an attempt to proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord uh, and to declare uh, his praise. And uh, uh, even although we know that our attempts are always inadequate and yet uh, they should always be wholehearted. And so we gather uh, to give thanks to our God for he is good and his love endures forever. Let's worship uh, the Lord as we sing together the, the text of our sermon this evening, Psalm 113. Holy. Continue to worship the Lord uh, in prayer. Let's pray together. Holy Heavenly Father, we thank you for these magnificent words that uh, we have just heard sung. We thank you uh, that you are a God who is worthy of all praise. We thank you that you are the God who is exalted high above all. And yet, Uh, You are also the God who draws near. Uh, You are the God who comes down. And Lord God, we pray that you would uh, help us this evening just to see more of who you are and to know more fully how we should respond to you. We thank you for the opportunity 
Dispersed as we are, we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, uh, in some sense, still gather together around your word. And Lord, we do pray that uh, whatever we are, that you would speak into our hearts and into our minds, that you would be greatly gloried, greatly glorified by our worship this evening, Lord. And we do ask that you would quite simply help us to see more of who you are, Holy God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Help us to see more of you, to love you more fully, and to respond to you ever more completely, we pray. And Father, in our worship, we want to, uh, to remember the needs of the world around about us. We, uh, we pray, Lord God, that you uh, would be active in this world. We are, uh, uh, we are aware, Lord God, of the, the, the strains and the difficulties and the tensions uh, that there are in so many parts of this world. We are so privileged to live in times of peace, and yet we know that there is great conflict in many areas. We, uh, we uh, in particular this evening, want to remember Bel uh, Belarus, Lord, and the civil tensions going on there. Uh, we, uh, uh, we pray for Slava Vyazovsky and his family and ask that you will bless them and protect them. And we do ask that your justice would be done in that land, that there would be real and lasting transformation. We're mindful also, Lord, of uh, uh, the conflicts and tensions that are taking place both in the Yemen uh, and in Ethiopia. And, uh, and Lord, we are, uh, uh, we're aware of uh, the, the great suffering that there is in so many parts of the world. And we pray that you would be active uh, in these lands as well to bring peace that is real and lasting. We do pray, Lord, that that would not just be uh, a political peace, but um, the, the peace that comes uh, from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do pray that, um, uh, that you would bring real changes uh, into these societies, Lord God, we ask. And Heavenly Father, we, uh, we want to, to pray for our own land in these days. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would bring uh, relief and release uh, from this uh, COVID crisis, Lord. We do pray that um, uh, vaccines will be perfected uh, and rolled out and that they will be effective, Lord God, we pray. We pray for our, uh, our, our leaders in, uh, uh, in Edinburgh and London and ask that you will give them great wisdom in days of uncertainty. And Holy Father, uh, we do pray. We want to just pray for our land as well. We acknowledge uh, that uh, as a people, we have turned from you. And we, we ask, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on us afresh. And we do pray for the renewal of your church and for revival in our land. We ask, Lord God, that you would be at work uh, to do that which is humanly impossible. And that you would bring real and lasting spiritual change to our land, we pray. And these, Lord God, in all of our prayers, uh, we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our reading this evening comes uh, from uh, Psalm 113. If you were with us this morning, uh, you'll... Uh, uh, remember that we were looking at Psalm 112 uh, and also Psalm 111. Uh, so it seems appropriate in this first Sunday of Advent that we should turn to, uh, to Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, 
who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading and the hearing of his word uh, this evening. Psalm 113 is a a, a psalm that is often read. It is traditionally read um, uh, during the the Advent season because of its profoundly uh, incarnational uh, imagery. I, I, I hesitate to use the word Christmas when we're not quite out of uh, uh, not quite out of November yet, uh, and yet today is the the, the first Sunday of Advent, a, a period of preparation, uh, a period of meditation, a period in which we uh, uh, we are designed to, which is designed to help us to dwell on the the miracles, uh, the miracle of the incarnation. The fact that God would become man. The fact that uh, the creator God would come down and, uh, and dwell among us. Uh, and it is indeed, it's appropriate that we take this time just to think about what is uh, really and um, uh, truly meaningful in, uh, in these days of Advent. And what we see in Psalm 113 here is this picture of just uh, the psalmist's attitude of compelling praise. His meditation on who God is, uh, the the, the high exaltedness of God, uh, and yet his approach to be alongside his people. And with this, uh, this powerful incarnational imagery uh, the, the God who is highly exalted drawing near uh, the psalmist's response is uh, a singular response of praise this compelling uh, passion for the, the praise of God uh, and there is something quite powerful uh, about the imagery that we see here uh, in, in Psalm 113 uh, it's that image um, uh, which I'm sure we've all, we're all familiar with. It's uh, it, you know when you've been away on that that dream holiday, or uh, uh, or uh, you've been away in a place which is, uh, in some sense, particular, uh, and all you can do is talk about that. Uh, and it's that image that when somebody starts a sentence by saying, "Oh, when I was in," everyone else in the room just groans because they've they, they've heard this uh, uh, heard this all so often. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I had the, the, the privilege of um, going out to Rwanda with Tear Fund. Uh, I do some, um, uh, some uh, uh, teaching for, on behalf of Tear Fund, and uh, uh, they, they took a bunch of us out to Rwanda. Uh, and I know that from, uh, for, for months afterwards, almost every conversation started with this idea of when we were in Rwanda, this happened or that happened. Uh, and there's, there's just a sense in which the experience is so compelling that it becomes, uh, it becomes front and center in our minds. It's, uh, it's, it's something that is difficult to, to, in some sense, let go of or, or, or move beyond. And what we see here in Psalm 113 is that the psalmist is, is, um, is just so taken up with his thoughts of who God is that he, he just cannot let them go. It's a very powerful uh, and compelling uh, sense of praise. There's a, there's a, a level of, uh, of excitement uh, in the language of praise that, um, that we find here, uh, and this real sense uh, in which he is entirely captivated with the God whom he worships. Uh, and he wants to express uh, something of that for uh, his peers and his community, and indeed, Uh, for us today. So there are three parts, three sections uh, to Psalm 113. 
Structurally, it breaks, breaks down quite nicely, which, uh, which is unusual for the sands because they tend to be structurally difficult. But, uh, uh, but Psalm 113 breaks into three parts. Firstly, you've got this imagery of compelling praise in uh, verses 1 to 3. And then uh, you get the rationale uh, for this compelling praise uh, in the remainder of the psalm. So, so um, secondly, we see in verses 4 to 6, uh, the imagery of the high and exalted God. Uh, and then uh, in verses 7 to 9, uh, the imagery of the exalting God. So compelling praise, the exalted God and the exalting God here. Now, I don't know about you, but... Um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly surprised that I'm going to say this out loud, but, uh, 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 you know, it's very tempting just to rush past the praise language at the start of Psalms, isn't it? It's, uh, it's very easy, easy just to think, oh, yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. Now, let's get on with the meat of the psalm. Let, what's this psalm actually about? Uh, and often we get a praise the Lord either at the beginning uh, or, or the end of a psalm, uh, and we almost, uh, we almost, we almost fail to read it. Our eyes pass over it, but it, 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 you know, it's an imagery that we see so often. Uh, it's an image that we see so often that we um, uh, we become inured to it, and we don't really think uh, about the, the the praise commands. Um, but here in Psalm 113, the, the the psalmist point blank refuses to allow that to become the case. You've got this extended meditation on the importance of praise uh, in these opening three verses. This lengthy consideration, commands to the community, remember to praise the Lord. And so it reads, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets the name of the Lord is uh, to be praised. And uh, it's almost as if the, the, the psalmist is making us pause in this attitude of praise. Uh, the emphasis is so fulsome here that he's just not willing to let us skip past the praise commands and move on uh, to, the, um, uh, to the, the, the main part of the text, the, the, the meat of the psalm. Uh, in that sense. So praise Yahweh. Praise you servants of Yahweh. Praise the name of Yahweh. You've got the, the different expressions of the same, uh, the, the same thought here. Uh, praising God. And the whole, I, the whole idea that we, we see here, praise, uh, praise the Lord, praise Yahweh. Praise you servants of Yahweh. Uh, the, the idea that we see here is that if a servant then we should be marked by praise. If we are servants of God, if we truly know and love the Lord, then in some sense, our hearts and minds, our attitudes will be marked by uh, the, the praise of the Lord. Praise the name of Yahweh. This, the idea of the name, uh, the, the, the consideration of, uh, of who God is, the consideration of who the Lord is. And as we think about his character and his being, as we think about his identity, and that's really what the name means, as we think about his character and his being, um, then, uh, then our response will uh, constantly and consistently um, be, uh, be marked by praise. If we know the Lord, if we truly love the Lord, if we have any awareness of uh, who he is and what he has done for us, then we can do no other um, uh, but to praise him. If we are servants of the Lord, then by definition, that means that we will be um, praising uh, servants of uh, the Lord. Now, the, 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 uh, as a book, the book of Psalms uh, is probably uh, quite singular in the, uh, in the Bible in, uh, in marking uh, genuinely dark experiences and marking uh, difficulty. Uh, it, the, in many ways, the, the, the voice of lament is as prominent uh, in the book of Psalms as is the voice of praise. 
Uh, and so clearly the psalmists want to, uh, uh, to verify the fact that we are not always in a good place. Uh, and indeed, these are difficult days. And many of us, it would be fair to say, are not uh, in a good place uh, and yet, even with that acknowledgement, even with that recognition that, uh, that life can, uh, and of, can be and often is difficult, yet if we take just a moment to contemplate who God is and all that he has done for us, then it will bring about in us an attitude of praise. It will bring about in us uh, a response of praise. Now, that doesn't deny uh, the, the difficulties and the stresses. It doesn't deny that these are real. Uh, and indeed, uh, it doesn't deny the fact that we should be expressing um, uh, these um, dark experiences before the, the Lord. We need to have a spiritual vocabulary uh, of lament. But when we think about God, when we think about being his servants, when we think about his character and his being, then we will respond to him. We will respond to who he is with uh, this voice of, of praise. Uh, and then verse two, let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore from the rising of the sun to the place where it's set. So you've got time and geography references here. Uh, let the name of the Lord be praised now and forevermore. Let the name of the Lord, uh, from the rising of the sun to the place where it's set, uh, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So from east to west, and the, the idea is at all points uh, in between. So at all times and in all places, uh, the name uh, of the Lord uh, is to be praised. This, this sense of his character and his works, the idea of the name of a uh, I'm sure this will never happen to any of you, but if a policeman ever says to you, stop in the name of the law, effectively what he's saying is, uh, by all that the law stands for and by the power that the law confers to me, um, I, I command you to stop. Uh, so when uh, praising the name of the Lord by everything um, that Yahweh stands for, as we think about his character, as we think about his being, uh, so our response will be uh, a response uh, of praise at all times uh, and uh, in all places. The word that's used for praise in, uh, in verses 2 and 3 is actually the, uh, it's the Hebrew word baruch. It's the, the, the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed, um, uh, quite literally. And it's just, it is the NIV is quite correct to uh, uh, translate it as praise. It is a synonym uh, for praise. One of the commentators, John Eaton, however, says this idea of blessing the Lord uh, is, uh, he, he describes it as the response of praise that is most warm with gratitude. It's the, the Hebrew word for praise that is most warm uh, with gratitude. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So you've got this really powerful imagery of praise that we see here in verses one to three. The psalmist draws us into this compelling, um, uh, this compelling song of praise uh, with the commands and the addresses to us as servants of the Lord. We're drawn in to his, uh, his exuberant praise. Uh, we're drawn in to be a part of that. So yes, so we can't skip past the praise language in Psalm 113. Uh, he, uh, uh, he makes us stop and consider the God who is worthy of our praise. And then secondly, we see, um, uh, we see the imagery of the exalted God in, uh, in verses four to six. So, um, uh, so psalms of praise are very simple uh, in their structure. Uh, some of the other psalms, psalms of lament, for example, are often quite complex in their, their structure and the way in which they outfold. But, um, uh, but psalms of praise are, are, are relatively straightforward. And, and effectively, what you normally have is a call to praise, as we've just seen uh, in verses 1 to 3. Um, and then a rationale for that praise. So you get the praise commands, 
And then we as readers are told why we should praise God. And that's whenever you read a praise psalm, whenever you read a, 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 a psalm that begins or ends with a hallelujah command, then the question that you should always be asking is why? What's the particular characteristic? What's the particular uh, focus that the psalmist has in mind here? Uh, and really, the, the, the rationale for praise, so you've got this really powerful, compelling call to praise in verses 1 to 3, uh, and the rationale for that praise is twofold. Firstly, the image, uh, we praise God because he is the exalted God, uh, and then uh, because he is the exalting God in verses um, uh, 7 to 9. But firstly, the exalted God, the, 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 the language that's used here. Um, it is particularly poignant in an ancient Near Eastern uh, setting. Some of it is hidden from us, uh, really, because we, uh, we, we don't see or know the cultural background behind the imagery that's used here. But the verse, uh, verse 4, the Lord is exalted over all the nations. So this is the divine name, Yahweh. This is the, God's personal name. Uh, Yahweh is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? Now, this imagery would be quite common uh, in the ancient Near East. The, the Hebrews and indeed um, uh, most of the cultures around about them uh, would view the, the cosmos, they would view creation as being made up of three spheres three domes of existence, as it were. Uh, there is the, the heavens, which was, uh, if you were a Hebrew, it was the dwelling place of God, of course. Uh, but if you, uh, if you were um, from one of the, the neighboring countries uh, around Israel, it would be the dwelling place of the gods, plural. Then the, the second dome or sphere of existence is the earth. So you've got the heavens, you've got the earth, uh, and then you've got the, uh, the, uh, the underworld or Sheol. So obviously the earth is the, the, the dwelling place of, uh, of humanity, uh, the dwelling place of the living, uh, and the underworld um, it would, it would have been seen as the dwelling place of the dead um, in, uh, in most of the, the, the cultures of the ancient Near East. And so the, we see the imagery that's being used here, the height imagery, which is somewhat hidden to us, but the height imagery is very poignant, very telling. Uh, in, uh, the ancient, um, uh, uh, in the ancient Near East. So um, for most of the countries around about Israel, the, uh, the heavens were a dwelling place of the gods and they would have uh, an image of a, a pantheon of gods, basically a parliament of gods. Uh, I, I mean, we're, uh, we're familiar with this from Greek mythology where uh, uh, you have uh, Zeus and all of the other gods um, who, um, who are displayed in very human characteristics, but they rule over the earth from their, their kind of parliament um, on, uh, on Mount Olympus uh, and so on. So most of the ancient Near Eastern cultures would have this idea of a pantheon of gods, and there would be one high god who ruled over the others. So in Greek mythology, obviously, it was Zeus. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the various different cultures, they would have, uh, have different names for this uh, high god. But note what the psalmist does here. He takes that imagery that was common currency in the ancient Near East, and he twists it to make a particular point. The Lord, so Yahweh, is exalted over all the nations. Now, that in itself is surprising because gods in the ancient world were, were territorial. They were geographic. Um, so Ra was the god uh, over uh, Egypt, the high god over Egypt, Shemesh over Assyria, uh, and so on. Gods, uh, the, the rule of the gods... Uh, extended only as far as the, the influence of the, the, the nation that worshipped that God. And here in verse 4, Yahweh is described as exalted over all the nations, not just Israel, not just the God of the Hebrews, but exalted over all the nations. But then notice again how the psalmist subverts this known imagery 
uh, in verse 4. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory where? Above the heavens. Notice that. Not in the heavens as you would expect. But Yahweh's glory is above the heavens. Who is like Yahweh our God? The one who sits enthroned. Now the idea of sitting enthroned, it's the, it's the idea of sitting in rule, sitting in judgment. So the, 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 there's, uh, there's no conflict. There's no challenge to Yahweh's authority. He sits enthroned um, uh, above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high. And then verse 6, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. So in the ancient Near East, there would be, uh, there, there would be, uh, it would be a common image for the gods to stoop down to look at the earth. But what do we see here uh, in, in verse 6? Yahweh has to, he is so highly exalted, he has to stoop down to look on the heavens. So all of the height imagery that we see here in verses 4 to 6 is, is just focusing our hearts and minds on the, uh, the incomparably exalted nature of God. He is the creator God. He is the one true high God who made all things and rules over everything. The great and uh, exalted God. Uh, and there's a sense here, why do we praise? We praise our God because of his very nature, because of his very being. He is the great God. He is the God uh, who made everything. He is the God who rules uh, over everything. And therefore, he is worthy um, of our praise. He alone is the one true God. So, compelling praise in verses 1 to 3. And then this image of God who is the great, high, exalted God, the creator of all things, who holds everything in its place, who orchestrates all of the events of humanity on a micro scale and on a macro scale. He is the God uh, who is uh, in control uh, and therefore uh, this exalted God is worthy of our praise. But then we see, uh, uh, then we see the, uh, uh, the, the imagery that goes alongside the, the, this picture of the exalted God in verses 7 to 9, where the psalmist turns our attention to, um, to his God as the exalting uh, God. He raises the poor from the dust, and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, and you can see why this uh, is a psalm which is traditionally uh, read during the Advent period because uh, the, the imagery that we see here in verses 7 to 9 is, in, is immensely and powerfully incarnational. Uh, this is uh, uh, imagery that, uh, uh, that, that points us to the work of Christ. The, the psalmist tells us hundreds of years before Jesus was born that this is God's nature. This is his very being. Even although he is the great high God, he is the God, he is also the God who approaches. He is also um, the God who, uh, who draws near. He is the one uh, who lifts up the lowly, the weak, the oppressed, the powerless, the voiceless and the disenfranchised. He is the one who comes alongside them and exalts them. He is the one who comes alongside the needy and lifts them up. And so the imagery that we see here uh, in, um, uh, in verses 7 to 9, it's the flip side of the coin of what we see in verses 4 to 6. 
So he is the exalted God. He is the all-high, all-powerful God. But this all-high, all-powerful God approaches. He comes near to us. He draws near to us in our messy reality. He stoops down and he lifts uh, us up. The images of the God, the God on high, reaching far down to help those in need, lifting up those who are unable uh, to help themselves. In short, the imagery that we see here in verses 7 to 9 is the imagery of a God who gets his hands dirty. A God who comes alongside us in our deepest need, in our hardest circumstances, and who lifts us up and who helps us in ways beyond our ability and who helps us indeed in ways that are beyond even uh, our imagining. Uh, and you see that um, in the, the image of the barren woman uh, uh, who is uh, placed in a home as a happy mother of children. A narrative that we see again and again throughout the Old Testament in the figures of uh, Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Hannah and so many figures throughout the, um, uh, throughout the Old Testament where God comes alongside his people. He hears their prayers and he does for them what they could not do for themselves. And surely that is what we remember in the Advent season. Uh, surely that is what we want to celebrate and that is what we want to focus our hearts and minds on uh, in this, uh, in this um, uh, season of anticipation of the, 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 the celebration uh, of the incarnation of Christ, the God who does for us what we could not do for ourselves, the God who was willing to be born in a stable, to live his life as a human being, getting his hands dirty, so that we could experience uh, the forgiveness of sins and uh, newness of life. And so this, uh, uh, this, uh, this Advent psalm points us back to Jesus. And I think in these difficult days, that should be our constant mantra, uh, shouldn't it? Uh, eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. We look to him, the great and exalted God who comes alongside us in the, the, the difficulties and in the challenges of daily life that we face. And as he comes alongside us, he equips and enables us in ways beyond our imagination. Amen. Let's pray uh, together. Holy God, we thank you that you are the great and exalted King, but we thank you also that you are the God who draws near. Thank you for the gift of your Son. We look to him as our light. We look to him as our Savior. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Spirit who dwells in our midst as a body of your people and who dwells in our hearts as individuals called by your name. And Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of salvation, the God who approaches, the God who draws near. May we be constantly aware of your great presence in all that we do. And may we do all things for your praise and for your glory. And this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And so we close uh, our worship this evening uh, with uh, the praise song. 
Ancient of Days. So the benediction, 
Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Amen.